Good afternoon, everyone. We are the Lobsters Research Project. My name is Stacy Pender Jr. I'm Odie Nicola. I'm Devin Tyree. I'm Fuller Clement. I'm Lucy Pike. I'm Craig Jones. I'm Tyler Walker. Um, our title for our research is Junk Food, the Role of Discards from the Bahamian Spiny Lobster and Sustaining Marine Scavengers. Before we begin, we'd like to say a special thank you to our research advisors, as you saw in Nick and Alex, and also our interns, Michelle, Annabelle, and Charlotte, for the countless amount of hours that they've put in to actually helping us collect this data. The Bahamian Lobster Fisheries brings in 80% of the total revenue in the fishing industry in the Bahamas. Since 1985, it has doubled from 1,000 to 2,000 tons. It is also estimated that 13.2 million lobsters are caught annually. The Marine Stewardship Council, or the MSC, certifies this Bahamian industry, this Bahamian fisheries as sustainable. And it's the, only sustain, it's the only certified sustainable lobster fisheries in the Bahamas and also in the Caribbean. This causes a higher demand of the lobster fisheries from restaurants all over the world because it is certified as sustainable. Sustainable simply means that it has minimal effects on the environment. In order to truly understand um, the effects that the lobster fishery has, we have to study the data, we have to study the effects of the lobster heads on the environment. So if you take a look at this picture over on my left, you'll notice that these, are, these lobsters are fully intact. That's because in lobster fisheries around the world, they actually keep the lobsters live and well. But this picture, you'll notice that it is just the lobster tails. That's because in the Bahamian lobster fishery, they actually remove the heads when they catch the lobsters and throw the heads back into the ocean as discard. Much, is due, much of this is due to the fishing regulations in the Bahamas that limits the amount of weight that um, lobster fishermen can keep, and they really have no use for the lobsters. In our research, we have three main objectives. First, we wish to understand the unforeseen impacts that the discards have on the environment. The lobster fishery is currently sus certified sustainable by the Marine Stewardship Council, and we wish to keep it this way. Next, we wish to collect data on all the species that interact with the bait. And lastly, we are determining the role that discards have on sustaining the marine environment. These could be positive or negative impacts. A positive impact would look like species actually having a reliable food source from the discards, and a negative impact would look like species becoming dependent on the discards. Our research hoped to answer three main questions. First, which species interact with lobster discards? Second, how do these discards impact behaviors of lobster predators? And third, are there any differences between soft sediment and reef habitats in terms of scavenger populations? On the map to my left shown is the island of Eleuthera. Um, right here, you can see the tip of Cape, Elu Cape Eleuthera and the yellow star shown is the Cape Luther Institute here at the Island School. For our research, we traveled out by boat to the Schooner Keys, which is this lighter area here, and we deployed, deployed both video cameras and lobster discards at each of the yellow points shown. The darker channels within the lighter sandbanks are soft sediment habitats, such as sand and seagrass, which are commonly used by Bahamian lobster fisheries. In contrast to these soft sediment deployments, we also deployed cameras at reef habitats shown by the red points, and these were used as our natural control for our research. So how do we actually collect our data? On a normal day, we can have anywhere from two to four deployments, which consists of a PVC frame, which is that, with a GoPro mounted onto it, and also our lobster bait, which is a lobster head attached to a PVC pipe with tape every 10 centimeters apart for size reference and a weight to keep it moving in the current. So before we head out on the boat, we get all of our, material, all of our materials together and get prepared. So this is just grabbing our materials and also taking some pre-deployment data. Once we head out in the boat, we go and do our deployment. Normally we have about two people in the water and one person up on land taking data in the field and then we leave the uh, deployment for about four hours because that's how long the camera records for about. And then once we come back, we do our recovery, grab the lobster head, and do some final uh, data analysis. Or once we get back to the classroom, we do our data analysis. This consists of uh, counting every single fish or every single organism that enters the frame, uh, whether or not they interact with the bait, this is eating it, and how many uh, of each organism are in the frame at minute intervals. Currently we, currently, we have over 60 hours worth of data, and special thanks to our interns who have been a really big help in analyzing this data. And 
So when we're uh, analyzing the data, we have to mark every single organism that interacts with the bait, and our videos look like this. So as you can see, there's a couple crabs eating the bait. We would mark them down as interacting. These are Amora that does not interact with the bait, so we would not mark that down as interacting. And this is a giant loggerhead turtle. That would be interacting with the bait. One method that we chose to analyze our data was a graph that depicts the frequency of species in soft sediment habitats compared to reef habitats. This helps us compare what species are prevalent in which areas. For example, the slippery dick is equally present in soft sediment habitats compared to reef habitats, but species like the blue crab are only present in soft sediment habitats. This also helps us understand the diversity in between each habitat. For example, the reef habitats have much greater diversity compared to the soft sediment habitats. Common scavenger species we found in our experiment included the slippery dick, which was the most common scavenger overall in our experiments, the bluehead wrasse and blue tang, which were very common in the reef habitats, and the Caribbean puffer, which was only present in the soft sediment habitats. Common predator species in our experiment are technically scavengers because they are eating dead lobster heads, but are recognized as living lobster predators. Both the queen and ocean trigger fish were commonly found in the reef habitats and minimally present in the soft sediment habitats, and the loggerhead turtle and blue crabs were exclusively found in soft sediment habitats. So if you look to the graph on my right, you'll see in the blue you have scavengers, and in the yellow you have predators. So basically this graph is showing the difference in percentage between scavengers and predators at reef and soft bottom sites. And one thing that we were surprised by is that usually predators are the first ones to find the lobster because they're, it's what they usually go for. But in our data, the scavengers found the bait way quicker. And that's why there's so many more of them at the site. Like if you look at the ratio, there's no difference between reef and soft bottom sites between scavengers and predator populations. In the second one on my right, you'll see the, this is the rate of consumption between scavengers and predators uh, for the lobster heads. And you'll see that this, when a scavenger is predator, uh, the bait is consumed much more slowly because they're slowly pecking at it. And we thought that, or we hypothesized that if we just left the deployment at the site with only scavengers, it would take about nine hours for it to be totally consumed. But when a predator shows up, such as the loggerhead turtle we observed, the bait is consumed almost instantly. Such as you'll see on the reef site, n equals one, that's the log red turtle. And you'll see on the soft bottom site, there's three predators that showed up and consumed the bait. So we can't draw a hypothesis between reef and soft bottom sites for these predators. But if you look at the scavengers between reef and soft bottom, you'll see that there's no difference between the rate of consumption. They consume the bait almost instantly, or not instantly, they just eat at the same amount of time because they're just slowly pecking at it. So our conclusions. We were very excited for all our conclusions because this is actually the first time anyone has ever looked into or investigated the effects of lobster head discards on the marine environment. We found that there's a wide range of scavengers that use the lobster heads as a source of food. We also found that in the soft sediment habitats where industrial lobster fishers would typically fish, that the species there differed in species composition and were less diverse compared to the reef habitats where you would typically find lobsters in the wild. This data will also serve as a building block for many future studies. Um, we were thinking about looking into the bluehead wrasse and slippery dick to see if their biomass has shifted into the soft sediment areas because that's typically where they would find the lobster heads because of the indus industrial lobster fisheries. We also have recently started a very exciting new triggerfish project, and we have caught three triggerfish so far. It is over at CEI. We are looking into the effects of lobster heads and dead lobsters and alive lobsters on triggerfish behavior. We are all very proud of the new knowledge we have generated, and we are very excited for the future prospects of the MSC Certified Sustainable Lobster Fishery in the Bahamas. Thank you very much.
these are our sources. Any questions? Based on your research, are there any strategic ways you could use the lobster heads to encourage uh, specific uh, species or whatever? Um, we're, we're not sure about that. Um, we can look into it after. <laughs> One of the questions you had was around, um, is, it, is there a negative impact or a dependency that's being created by the fish heads? Did you draw any conclusions or just any thoughts about that from your data or research? So the question was, um, one of our research objectives was to see if there are na any negative impacts um, on lobster discards on the marine environment. Um, that was one of our research objectives, but our main questions were just trying to figure out what species interact with the bait. Um, and that was sort of, a, like Tyler was saying, a building block for future research. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, does uh, these discards have any effects on existing lobster populations? And as far as our research goes, we did not see any lobsters interacting with the bait or showing up in our, any of our research, so we would not be able to answer that question. What's the most common thing that you saw going for the lobster heads? So the question was, what was the most common species we found going for the lobster heads? Uh, the most common species we found interacting with the bait was the slippery dick in both the soft sediment and reef habitats. <laughs> Thank you.